Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for attending Laurie's Milton Lecture Series, and welcome to the first lecture of 2022. It's been a long January, it feels like. This series uh, runs from the second Wednesday of the month from October to May at 7 p.m. If this is your first lecture of the series, hello, welcome. And if not, welcome back. It's good to see you again. My name is Carolyn and I work for Wilfrid Laurier University. And we are so proud to be partners with the Milton Public Library on this incredible series. Some housekeeping as usual. You have been muted on entry with video turned off. We have some time carved out for questions. So if you have them, please use the Q&A function at the bottom right. The lecture is being recorded and it'll be shared via email by the library in the near future. Before we bring the, begin the program this evening, we would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the shared traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and the water on which Laurier is now present. Perhaps this evening you're joining us from another location. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the traditional territories on which you reside. I'm excited this evening to introduce our topic and our speaker. Our topic this evening is Ethics in Design with Dr. Heidi Northwood. Heidi is the Senior Executive Officer of Laurier's Brantford campus, where she works to create opportunities and strategies that advance Laurier's academic mission, build relationships with campus partners, and support academic and administrative leaders. Heidi is also Laurier's Senior Executive Officer Global Strategy both the institution's executive lead and internationalization strategy champion, working to guide and support the future of internationalization at Laurier. Heidi is also a professor of philosophy. Prior to joining Laurier in 2014, she was the director of the integrative programs in the core curriculum at Nazareth College in Rochester, New York, and a professor in the philosophy department. Heidi received her bachelor's and master's degree in philosophy from Western University, and her PhD in philosophy from the University of Alberta. Thank you so much, Heidi, for being with us this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And good evening. Thanks so much for having me here tonight and thanks for joining. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to give a talk about design ethics. And I'm very happy that it's through this collaboration between the Milton Public Library and Wilfrid Laurier University. I live in Hamilton and my Laurier campus is in Brantford, where I, we're doing some pretty cool things, by the way. Um, but I grew up about seven kilometers from here, Milton, on Bernathorpe Road in the 16 Mile Creek. So I still have deep roots in the area and uh, my brother still lives in our family home, which my father built in the 1950s. So in many ways, this feels like a homecoming. So thanks. I'm gonna start my presentation now, my PowerPoint. So I'll just get that going. All right, there we go. So that's close to where I grew up. So now I'll start. All right. So tonight we're going to explore some of the ways that design and ethics intersect, where ethics is in design and as a consequence, the responsibilities that designers have and indeed the responsibilities that design schools have to ensure that their graduates are equipped to bear this responsibility. So roadmap of the, of the talk. I'll start by speaking a little bit about the big questions and the terrain of this topic. What kinds of questions one should ask to figure out the ethical elements of design? Then we'll have some fun by looking at four examples of what are arguably bad design and in diagnosing some of what went wrong, it will, I hope, become clearer where ethics is in design, the intersections, the shared kinds of problems and reasoning, and the requirements for the discovery of good solutions. 
this should suggest some possible answers, I hope, to what the responsibilities are for both designers and the institutions that educate them. There should be about 15 minutes for questions at the end, and I look forward to hearing what you think. So here we go. Design actively shapes our lives minute by minute. My fence provides a barrier between my neighbor's yard and my own, so I don't walk there. My new winter boots, pictures there, have special grips on the sole so I can walk more securely on slippery pavement, so I walk more quickly. My laptop is relatively lightweight and doesn't get too hot, so I do a great deal of my work sitting cross-legged in my armchair, including indeed putting together this talk. Almost everything, if not everything, around us is the result of some kind of design. And these designs can and do influence, shape, or restrict our choices and our actions. So our experiences are affected by and shaped by the design decisions made in the creation of those product, products or technologies, whether or not these influences were deliberately designed. These influences or constraints are one of the things we're interested in tonight. And more broadly put, we're interested in the contributions of these design products to our experiences, our lives. Are they good or bad, positive or negative? Think boots, fences, and computers. But what is meant by good and bad here? We've all had the experience of dealing with things that are poorly designed. I'm sure you can think of many cases of this in your own experience. Perhaps a gift you received over the holidays didn't live up to the online hype. Maybe you experienced frustration trying to get a mask that fits you well, or figuring out an online appointment reservation procedure for your booster shot. If you think back to a trip that involved a hotel stay, I'm sure you can remember a shower faucet that was difficult to figure out. These experiences can be frustrating, disappointing, annoying. But our question here is not about assessing the product with respect to how well it performs its function, or even its aesthetic qualities, whether it's beautiful or ugly. So it's not good or bad, positive or negative contributions in these functional or aesthetic senses. Instead, our question involves the moral assessment of a product's contribution to our experience. It's the moral good or bad or interested in and concerned with. So back to fences, boots, and computers, all three work, at least in my experience, all three in my life have, and they all look pretty enough. But this, isn't, this doesn't get at the moral assessment of their contribution to my life, or at least not straightforwardly. So new question, what does it mean to assess what, sorry, what does it mean to morally assess a thing's contribution to our experience? By thing here, I'm referring to anything that's been designed and made by a human. Fences, boots, and computers, sure, but also services, policies, and programs, and what we usually call technologies. The stuff of computer programs and interfaces, our smartphones, the apps we use every day, and the like. We're talking about all human-made things, whether they be can openers, vaccine booking websites, government policies, the app on your phone. And what follows, I'll use the term that fits the context best. So I might say thing, product, artifact, technology, but for our purposes, the question that we're asking tonight, they are essentially the same. Okay, so, what, so again, what does it mean to morally assess these things? We'll get into this further by looking at our four fun examples, but first I want to talk a little bit about a very important and common kind of assessment of a product's contribution to our experience. Indeed, the centerpiece of most engineering ethics courses, legal regulations, professional codes of conduct, and the like. Namely, the answer to the question, is it safe? Safety considerations are of paramount importance to the profession of engineering, and when a poor engineering design leads to a faulty and unsafe product, bridge, road, what have you, it's a clear case of a thing making a bad contribution, a negative contribution to a life or lives. 
the moral assessment here is really an assessment of the process that led to the faulty design. Of course, conflicting pressures between costs, launch dates, and profit can lead to errors, to pressures to cut corners, and so on. And that's why there are laws, regulations, design specifications, and so on for engineers, as well as whistleblower protections. Engineers are responsible for creating things that are safe and indeed are morally and le legally culpable if they do not. But I should warn you at this point that other kinds of designers, in particular those software designers who make our computer interfaces and apps for our phones, while required to follow all applicable laws, have far fewer constraints on their work than engineers. There are no codes of ethics that are formalized, at least by professional organizations. There are no professional standards, no oaths taken. There's nothing equivalent to the engineer's ring. This is part of the reason why ethics in design, in this kind of design at least, is so important right now. It's a bit of an ethical wild west for a huge number of those products that affect us daily. Our four examples are going to take us beyond this kind of a bad contribution, an unsafe product that can harm us, uh, that can cause us physical injury or worse death, and beyond this kind of ethical issue the issue being harming another through malice or carelessness, and the related responsibility, which is don't do that. I'd like to push us further. For surely life is about more than just whether we're alive. Life is also about our goals, our deliberations, our choices, our actions, and our passions. I'd like to explore how else we should assess a product morally. So we'll ask, for example, does, it, does a design product or technology help us flourish or does it diminish us or hold us back? Does it help us to become better or worse as individuals and as a species, both in isolation as well as within the whole? In sum, what ways can products or technologies make good or bad contributions to our lives in this fuller sense? These are the sorts of questions to have in mind as we turn to our four examples. All right. So slide number, sorry, <laughs> example number one, the Robert Moses Parkway bridges, famous example. What could be morally problematic about a bridge? Well, I'll start with a quotation that gives us, that will give us uh, some background for this one. According to one author, um, Peter Paul Verbeek, uh, and I quote now, architect Robert, Robert Moses deliberately built a number of overpasses on parkways in Long Island, New York, too low for buses. This implicitly limited access to the beach for African-Americans who could not afford cars of their own. That's the end of the quote. This conclusion, Verbeek's conclusion was based on an analysis done by Langdon Winner in a now famous article, Do Artifacts Have Politics? And that itself was based upon a 1974 biography of Robert Moses called The Power Broker by Robert A. Carroll, in case you're interested. There's quite a bit of controversy over this analysis now, the one that I just uh, quoted. And the controversy centers around whether Robert Moses deliberately built these bridges to exclude poor and or racialized people from being able to enjoy the beach, whether he had racist views that informed his design decisions explicitly, or whether the bridge design was the result of other factors. In Caro's book, there are quotes from Moses' aides saying that the bridge heights were deliberately designed to keep certain groups of people out. But there's some question about the veracity of the quotes and even some question about whether Caro's motives were unbiased in his portrayal of Moses. Skeptics of the explicit racism of Moses point to the context of parkway design at the time. So now I'm going to do another quote, and this one's a little bit longer, but I think it's just a great one. So I had to, had to, had to have it in full. <clears throat> so here we go. Low slung and clad in ashlar stone, the bridges were essential to parkway stagecraft, part of a suite of details meant to create a sense of romantic rusticity. The parkway was just that, a way through a park. It was designed to both literally and figuratively remove you from the city a central park for the motorist. Berms and lush plantings screened off views disruptive of the reverie, creating an almost cinematic impression of driving through a vast pastoral landscape. 
as leisure and recreation infrastructure, park before way, commercial traffic was excluded on all the early American parkways. This meant not only trucks, but buses. Banning big, noisy commercial vehicles was essential to the aesthetics of the parkway and had nothing to do with racial discrimination. There would have been no need to use the bridges on the southern state as barricades of a sort. Buses were not allowed on this or on any other state parkway in the first place. Okay, that's the end of the quote. Skeptics of explicit racism, of that that he was, that Moses was explicitly racist and that that informed his designs uh, intentionally, also point out that there was bus access to the beaches, just not through the park. All right, so the facts of this case. One, Robert Moses designed a parkway with bridges that physically prevented buses from using it. Two, this had the consequence of limiting access to this central park for the motorist to those who could afford a car, even though it was a state park. And three, there is controversy about whether Moses did this explicitly. <clears throat> okay, so while this example is a historical one, and one would one that one that we would like to think wouldn't happen today. It's interesting that the controversy is centered around whether Moses's design was intentionally exclusive or not. Granted, if we want to know about the moral character of the person, Robert Moses, this is relevant. And the moral character of those with power to make these sorts of design decisions is indeed relevant to whether we want them to have this power to affect others' lives on such a grand scale. But whether it was intentional or not is in many ways irrelevant. The consequences for those affected are the same. When we ask the question here, does it, this design, this thing, contribute to our lives positively or negatively, what the Robert Moses Parkway Bridges example shows us is that the answer to this question is very, de very different depending on who the us is. If you were a middle-class car owner, the parkway was a beautiful refuge from the loud, smelly highway, a wonderful part of the journey to the beach. But if you were carless, well, you might not even know about it, or if you did, you'd likely be angry that once again, you were excluded from something that you right, had a right to as a citizen and your journey to the beach was longer, more fiddly and ugly. Perhaps you didn't go to the beach at all. And while we hope that the purported intentional racism of this in this design is a thing of the past, we all have blind spots that can lead to similar results and designers are certainly not exempt. Examples are plentiful. Main doors to buildings that feature sweeping staircases, aesthetically gorgeous, um, and revolving doors that exclude those who use wheelchairs. Facial recognition software that misidentifies faces with darker shades of skin. Metaphors that underlie human computer interactions that are culturally specific and so incredibly confusing or unusable to those of other cultures. Television remote controls that have buttons too small to be used by arthritic hands. The ethical issues here are justice, fairness, and inclusion. And it's the responsibility of designers to ensure that all those who are supposed to be able to use the thing can do so. But as a designer, how can you be sure that you've taken all the different viewpoints into consideration? How can you be sure that your own experiential bias isn't making you blind to the effects of your design on others who are different from you? How can you be sure that you're not just designing something for yourself? Do you design for the average Joe and Josephine, ignoring all the other segments of the population? What are some sometimes called edge cases, those cases that are on the extremes of the curve that represents what is most prevalent in a population? Or is there another possibility? The emphasis on research and user experience design is supposed to mitigate this. Designers are taught to go out and observe and talk to those who would be using the product. But as one author has noted, even those who attempt to look outside their own experiences will only ever know what questions to ask based on that experience. Even those doing good research can only ask questions they think to ask. 
The development of empathy and allyship in design the school curriculum is another attempt to counter this. But so too, and more effectively, is the insistence that design teams themselves be diverse and representative of the groups that, that the design is meant to serve. Indeed, and this is a quote from, from somebody quoting somebody else, and I can give it to you later if you want, but it's, <clears throat> why teach people to think outside the box when you can hire people outside the box? The best design curriculum includes this kind of teamwork to show the benefits of designing for inclusion and so justice. Okay. Example number two, the antelope ashtray or whatever creature, I'm afraid. I don't know for sure if it's an antelope. I used to live and work in Rochester, New York, as Carolyn mentioned, and in my neighborhood was the house of George Eastman, the founder of Kodak. And I visited the house museum theater often. On one such visit, visit I noticed this, this ashtray made out of the foot of maybe an antelope that George Eastman reportedly killed himself while on safari in Africa. There are a number of things that we could point to as morally suspect in this object. Its purpose as a receptacle for cigarette or cigar ashes. It's an aid to an activity that is harmful to us. As a memento of a safari in Africa, one might think its status as a trophy normalizes a morally problematic colonial practice. What I'd like to focus on, however, is what it's made from. For this object to exist, obviously an animal had to die. And this points to a broader ethical issue for design. Questions about how materials are produced, acquired, manufactured. And while we're at it, let's add what's ha what happens to the materials after the product is discarded. Now, in this case, one could rightly point out that many of the things we consume involve the killing of animals. And so perhaps what needs to be considered is how the killing was done. Was it, hum was it done humanely, whatever that means? And also whether or not the object is necessary. Is it something we need or something that we just want? Is, it the, is the object frivolous or morally suspect, as is arguably the case with our antelope ashtray? But even this question is complicated. For should we consider only our basic needs or should we expand this to include our need for a variety of experience to fully flourish? There are clearly a whole host of very important and complicated ethical questions that could be explored here. For our purposes tonight, I want to focus on just what our example does to our ethical field of vision. Our first example, the Robert Moses Bridges, showed us that designers need to be thinking about how their designs affect people who might not be the same as themselves. This example, the ashtray, is meant to push the designer to think more broadly still, to think about other species and the natural environment. For, e for, for if one has the view that animals um, and the environment are, e so, sorry, even if one has the view that animals and the environment are resources for humans, this is still important. This is about sustainability, about protecting the environment for others, for future generations. Designers need to ask how their design decisions will affect those who come after, much like the Haudenosaunee seventh generation principle, which asks decision makers to think about how their choices will affect all those for the next seven generations. And designers need to think, uh, need to ask how their design decisions affect others now, as does the dish with one spoon, um, the agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, which asks you to reflect that we are all eating from the same dish. And so we should be respectful, leave some for others, don't take the first thing you come across and so on. One should ask, is this decision good for others? How does the production of this in this way affect others now and in the future, both respect to how it's acquired, but also what happens to the object after it's discarded? Does the function of an object justify, ethically speaking, the materials for it, how they were acquired, and their half-life? Okay. So, where ethics and design intersect so far in our conversation, discussion, lecture. Okay, we're gonna switch gears now. Our first two examples were about how designed things and designers can be morally, can be assessed morally 
with regard to how they treat other humans, other species, and the environment. Does the design exclude segments of the population when it shouldn't? And we can add, was the means of production of the product itself morally acceptable? This slide just sums up where we've come so far. <clears throat> I'll just give you a moment just to look at it. By the way, the four um, purpose for materials and production, um, I'm showing my true colors. I'm an Aristotle, Aristotle um, scholar, uh, ancient Greek philosophy. And indeed, um, those are Aristotle's four causes there. So in case anyone's wondering the purpose of the thing, how it's put together, the organization the materials and how, it's, how it comes to be. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next. So now I'd like to turn to a different kind of intersection of ethics and design. When designers intentionally try to make people behave better, morally speaking, by means of their designs. The speed bumps on my street. Okay. Speed bumps are an interesting example of an object that is explicitly designed to change people's actions for the better by forcing a decision between two possible outcomes. The first, proceed quickly, but with the possibility of damaging the axle of my car. And two, slow down and protect my car. The design behind speed bumps bets on the likelihood that longer term self-interest, protecting your car, will trump the short-term desire of getting more quickly to one's destination, the joy of speeding or whatever it is. The consequence, a safer speed through a neighborhood and the protection of others, pedestrians and other car drivers. Based on research in psychology, brain chemistry and cognitive science, such a nudge, an object designed to nudge people to be good can be very effective. There are many other examples of these kinds of designs. Um, hotel key cards that must be inserted into a slot before the electricity for the room uh, will turn on. A photocopier with a default, default setting of two-sided printing instead of one. Shopping carts that require a deposit of a quarter or a loony that's returned uh, when the card is returned. And then there are also all those apps on our phones that nudge us to be healthy eaters, physically active by rewarding or gamifying good behavior. Lots and lots of examples of this. The intent of these kinds of designs that nudge us in the right direction, that make uh, making the right choice easier are clear. Depending on them, which one it is, safety, health, both mental and physical, conserving natural resources, our responsibility to others in all shapes and forms. Even ethical codes of conduct and the law are like this. They're nudge designs. Insofar as they force a choice between bad behavior with potential punishment and better behavior. An initial question. If we're being nudged in these ways, well, who's to say whether the designer has the goal right? It's a huge question. It's about the character of the person. It's about their their education, their experience, their you know their motivations. Um, it's a big question for perhaps another day. So let's just say the designer has it right, right? But the issue is that still many things can go wrong. What I find interesting in the particular case of the speed bumps on my street is that the design backfired take a closer look at the photo and imagine that on the right here, there's actually usually uh, cars parked. Can you see the problem? The turtles are so, as they're called, the bumps, right, are so placed that most vehicles can avoid the bumps by either moving slightly into the bike lane um, or into the opposing lane. You can tell a local from a visitor to the neighborhood by whether they do this or not. Even the buses do it. Far from for forcing a choice between slower, safer driving and a potential damage to one's car, this speed bump of turtles forces a choice between maintain speed and see if I can line up my tires well with an anticipated little joint of pleasure from doing it and appearing to be a neighborhood insider to neighbor to, to any nearby witnesses, 
between that and slow down and look like a loser. What this gets at is a different issue that designers need to consider, how to predict how their designs will be used. Humans are complicated and wily creatures. These nudges may result in completely unintended consequences that are completely counter to the original intent. There's another famous example of this that I came across in the past um, months. A daycare center in, in Haifa uh, imposed a small fine to parents who were late picking up their children at the end of the day, trying to fix the problem. But far from decreasing the number of late pickups, the fine resulted in more late pickups of children since the introduction of the fine monetized the lateness. In effect, lateness became something one could pay for, subverting the moral obligation to be on time. So what are the responsibilities of designers here? The first responsibility, I think, is to be aware of the power that one has and that designs can backfire so easily. Arrogance has no place here, ethical, ethically speaking. The second responsibility is to learn as much as possible about humans to be able to anticipate a little bit what's likely. Study psychology, history, anthropology, sociology, maybe, maybe philosophy. The third is to develop as much as possible one's moral imagination perhaps by reading literature, talking to people, putting oneself into, into other people's shoes as much as possible, imagining what that is like for them. But even with this knowledge, a good moral character, experience, skills, one can still be way off. This is why design disciplines, uh, especially, and I'm going to point again to user experience design, put so much weight on the iterative process that the term used uh, for, for indicating going out, right, and testing prototypes to see how humans actually will use it, and then modify the design given what one learns. If you can't accurately predict how humans will react to your nudge, you can at least be ready to modify your design once you see how they do. Okay, to our last example, the like button. The like button found throughout the internet was invented for a similar purpose as the speed bump to nudge us in a certain direction. Justin Rosen, um, Rosenstein and Leah, Perl Leah Perlman, two young idealistic employees at Facebook in 2007, were working to make a world in which people lift each other up where positively is the path of least resistance. According to K Cliff Quang in his book, User Friendly, which I highly recommend, the particular design problem that they were working on was to make it easier for people to respond positively to posts in Facebook newsfeed, other than reposting the, item, the news item in their own feed or else responding in the comments with something like congratulations or yay or like, you know, something positive. They came up with the prototype, the awesome button. And after numerous debates within Facebook, uh, apparently Zuckerberg himself made the call it would be called the like button. It would have the icon thumbs up. So far, so good. The purpose was laudatory and it took off. And it's now the single most ubiquitous interface of the 21st century used every day by hundreds of millions of people, according to Quang. So what could go wrong? Well, humans could go wrong, right? It turns out that we as animals are built, have evolved such that we get obsessed, addicted, go wild with random rewards. Skinner, of course, and his box, uh, with his box, asked whether rats would respond more quickly if food rewards came predictably or if they came randomly. And it turns out the answer was by far randomly. Right? They just went nuts for it, the rats did. And in this case, we're just like rats. The reward centers in our brains start blinking, sending out dopamine, which gives huge pleasure jolts whenever things turn out slightly differently than we expect, or when something happens that isn't fixed, but might happen. The current thinking is that this dopamine circuitry evolved uh, to reward us for finding out new things, for making us alert to the discovery of new patterns and, and so forth. This psychological fact has major consequences. 
It has led to our becoming addicted to our smartphones, checking to see if there's a new message, if someone has liked something we've posted, if so on. Like, has it, has it come? Has it come? Don't know. And the tech companies and their designers know this and use it. And we willingly comply because of the dop dopamine jolts that come from our engagement with these interfaces. And the psychology and neurochemistry has become more sophisticated, more understood as the, as the years have passed. There's now a vast amount of psychological data in the hands of these tech companies upon which they can build new apps and technologies that make the use of these facts about our brain. As an example, B.J. Fogg, a professor at Stanford, codified three psychological principles that appear to be at work with apps that are, as he calls them, sticky. Motivation, trigger, and ability. In other words, create a motivation no matter how silly or trivial. I think of those games I play myself on my phone. Provide a trigger that lets a user sate that motivation and then make it easy to act upon. This knowledge in the hands of certain kinds of design makes us ripe for psychological manipulation. And again, if you wanna know more about this, check out Quine's book and I can give you the reference in the Q and A. It's fascinating. <clears throat> so back to the like button. What happened was unexpected, just like our speed bump example, but nonetheless, it follows a logical sequence from where positivity is the path of least resistance to a place of homogene uh, homogeneity rather than diversity, where only the voices we hear are those of our virtual neighbors who think exactly like, like us. And just think about it, you know, even um, you know, our Facebook groups, our, our, our LinkedIn, in groups, um, it's the ones who uh, think like us that end up being part of our circles. Right? As was written in the New York Times, and this is a quote, um, Facebook most, Facebook's most consequential impact may be in amplifying the universal tendency towards tribalism. Posts di dividing the world into us and them rise naturally, tapping into users' desire to belong. Its game-like interface rewards engagement, delivering a dopamine boost when users accrue likes and responses, training users to indulge behaviors that win for affirmation. And because its algorithm unintentionally privileges negativity, the greatest rush comes by attacking outsiders, the other sports team, the other political party, the ethnic minority. Okay, so we're nearing the end of this talk. We've seen that ethics and design are intimately connected to each other. Design work includes and excludes, has effects on the natural world, treats people well or not, lifts them up or holds them down, can nudge people in good directions or manipulate us for gain. Design work even seemingly small decisions can have unforeseen long-term effects. This kind of work, design, is in the business of influencing human beliefs, desires, and actions. And as we've seen with our last example, can have wide-ranging and long-term effects that can alter the ethical terrain that we occupy and can, in effect, change the world. It should be no surprise that ethics is in design. All of our del deliberations, choices, and actions have effects on others, on those around us, and on the environment, some more than others, and some with long range effects, some with longer range effects than others, both spatially and temporally. The more power one has, <clears throat> the greater the influence and the, gr the greater the responsibility to do it well. Designers, however, sorry, the more power one has, right, the, the greater the influence. Designers, however, do this for a living. They make products that we use. They design processes we need to navigate. They build the race course that we run through. While all leaders can have this kind of wide reaching power and are so observed and criticized as such, 
designers often fly, fly underneath our ethical radar, even though their quiet decisions can have just as far reaching impacts on human life as a powerful political leader. So what are the ethical responsibility of designers and responsibilities of design schools to ensure that their graduates are equipped to deal with this? I'll end by listing what we've come up with so far tonight. So ask the right questions right, about purpose, materials, and production. Is the purpose good, ethically speaking? Are the materials, uh, do they come from good ethical sources? Do, does the, again, just as we talked about in the first, uh, in the second example, um, what happens to them after the material is, the, after the product is discarded? Same to the production process. Think about the long-term effects of the design. Expand one's ethical field of vision beyond oneself to other species and the environment. Of course, know the relevant laws, regulations, and standards. Observe and talk to users of the design. Make sure that you know what they want and what they need and how they will use it. Build a diverse design team and a diverse community to ensure that um, your own biases are in fact not coloring and shaping uh, your design in a way that is unintended. Encourage humility and curiosity in the face of the unknown, right? We don't know how humans will, even with the best of knowledge, won't know how they use our designs. Educate oneself broadly in the arts and humanities so that you have a better understanding of humans and actually a broader understanding of um, um, yeah, of, of the responsibilities, if you include ethics, as well as, of course, all the other humanities and arts, and evaluate all designs and be willing to modify them based upon what you learn. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and your questions, and I'll stop sharing now. Hello, um, my name is Marie Patrico and I am from the Milton Public Library. We are ready to begin the facilitated um, question portion of the evening. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them in the ask a question link and uh, we can get started on that soon. I'm glad you talked about speed bumps because I've always wondered about that and 100% you're correct. You we're going to go either down the middle so that one of our tires doesn't have to go over it or or try to swing around. So it's it entailed purpose really ends up potentially causing harm. You know, you don't know if someone's going to be a cyclist right behind you, right? Coming, right. coming down the side or... Um, of course, I never do that, Maria. We never... I never line my tires up in the middle. <laughs> I don't like going to the side because I always think there's lots of debris there. So then I do the middle part. Um, we're getting a lot of thank yous and uh, people really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and Carolyn's posted the uh, the um, right the, the last bit the last <laughs> bit as well. Oh, here we go. There was a book you referenced a couple of times. Could you mention the title and author again? Yes, you bet. It's um, a book by, I don't have it. Oh, I do have it next to me. Let me see if I can look it up. It's a book by um, by Cliff Quang with Robert Fabricant, and it's called User-Friendly, How the Hidden Rules of Design Are Changing the Way We Live, Work, and play. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy to um, actually put that in uh, a note that can be sent out by the library if, if necessary. In fact, it's, I also had it in um, all the books that I pop it into this, uh, oops, yeah. right here. I'm That's actually great. using it in, the, uh, in my course right now and we're starting it tomorrow. Well, wonderful. Oh, um, okay. thank you. Alan beat me to it. <laughs> What, what, which course? 
it's called design ethics, believe it or not. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect and timely. Um, we'll just wait in a couple more minutes if anyone, uh, sometimes people need to gather their thoughts a little bit after the, uh, the presentation. You gave us a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, I mean, even when you showed the, um, the hoof as a, an ashtray, there's so many things like that, even growing up that I'm, I'm trying to recall that people thought it was okay to use, you know, when you have, I'm always trying to think of like those movies that had the bear rug with the bear head. That kind of made me think of that. It's interesting, isn't it? That even that is less, it seems less shocking than the, the ashtray. And I think it's probably, sure. and it's the same thing, like a leather coat, leather mm -hmm. shoes. Yeah. Um, there are alternatives. Um, so I, I mean, it's, it's what we're used to. Right. And so, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is really interesting for showing how we can be totally blind to what, um, to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions that have come through. Abby is asking, can you address the tension that design educators sometimes feel in trying to balance the need to train students for careers where they will need to know how to design for behavioral persuasion and marketing needs of companies versus teaching them the ethics of design? Whew. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, this, this that question has come up. Um, the, um, the term is only, what, um, a week and a half in for, for us at Laurier, but uh, in, in speaking to my students, I'm not sure if they're here tonight, so I hope they are. Um, uh, that's this one of the major things they're actually concerned about as they're in their third and fourth years is what do they, um, how do they navigate doing what they know they have to be, what they have to do to keep the job that they have, um, and even just to gain the experience, how do they balance that with, um, with doing what they take to be by their own lights the right thing, right? Um, so. Uh, manipulation. I mean, it's not just in in design work that that there's manipulation. It's manipulation all over the place, right? And in fact, even um, you think about the classical rhetoric and what that was all about. Rhetoric itself, right, um, been around for a long, long time, um, has exactly the same issues in it, right? So, is it being done? Is the is the is the manipulation or is the persuasion perhaps? Is it is a better way of putting it? Is the persuasion meant to um make things better or is it for gain i think is the long and short of it to sort of <laughs> right if it's this or that right is it is it trying to make um lives better or is it for self-interest and i think that's probably what um for the most part students have to balance it's funny we're reading we've been reading a book that actually abby goodrum the the, the program coordinator for our user experience design program i know she's given a talk in this yes in this as well she she pointed out a book to me um which i quoted briefly but i didn't mention the name of by mike montero called uh, ruined by design and one of the things actually the purpose of his book is actually to argue for <clears throat> um a design a, a code of ethics for designers but even as it is um he keeps coming back to um well if it's just bad enough just quit right just quit your job you know, throw the the what's the expression? Throw the the wrench in the in the the wheel. Yes, whatever the expression is. I don't know, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> but but my students are saying, how am I supposed to do that? Right? How how we not got? Um, um, so it's it's a very difficult one. But I think it's not it's not just in the design fields that this is the case. Right? It's across the board. Mm -hmm. it's, allowing people to have the strength of character to know when enough is enough um, and to walk away, but um, balancing um, their own needs and their own um, real requirements to keep a job even when um, they wish they didn't have to. Right? That's yes. something that a lot of people have to deal with. Being in a test. I hope that answers the question. It's, it's a complicated one. Mm -hmm. Um, Helen is asking, do you know if ethical boundaries are being developed now for the internet and who would develop such boundaries? 
there are professional uh, associations that are starting to talk about this. Uh, and I know, I mean, even um, as I mentioned, Mike Montero, he has, um, he has this uh, a code that he's been circulating on the internet and trying to get people to be thinking about this. And it's, it's very much rooted in um, um, well, like asking, um, asking why you're being asked to do something, um, saying no, being a gatekeeper is the way that he, see, he sees himself, and then all of the ethical codes that would go with that, um, like making sure that your designs are inclusive, that you're actually listening to those who, who are your users, etc. cetera. Um, but my understanding is that um, while there are many like Mike Montero doing this, um, I haven't seen anything, and perhaps others on the who in the audience know more than I do about how far this has gotten along. My sense is that it hasn't gotten very far. It's hard to implement, I think. Um, okay, Tans is asking. Does following ethical design principles help create a more circular economy going forward? Oh, what's meant by circular economy? Don't know. Tans, would you please expand on that question? Let's go to another one while he, he kind of offers that expansion. Um, so Kevin is asking, in terms of the course you plan to take, could you talk more about what you hope to learn from the course and why that one stood out for you? The course I'm teaching or the course I'm teaching? I think the I think the one you're teaching. I I, I suppose you have designed the course itself. Um, um, okay. The book one. Okay. This one I thought was very interesting. Megan. Um, are ethics professors like yourself involved in court cases, rulings in court over permits, etc.? I'm not. Um, but I do know that um, um, well, I expect that there are some, just not me. Okay, so um, Tans hasn't expanded on what he meant by circular economy. Um, we have some interesting things. Um, Heather <laughs> noted that there's an interesting ethical decision in, in the design of this forum as well, with vote buttons to add more or less weight to people's questions. And I was able to get through all of them, but it's it's true, and and it does, um, you know, sometimes the, the person hosting it distract us a little bit because I was ready to ask another question and something popped up that was thought provoking. So I thought I would move forward with that one. But if you have a hundred questions, that you need that type of system to be able to move forward. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's all our questions this evening. So um, thank you so much on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University and the Milton Public Library, Heidi. You've shared your knowledge and expertise and incredible re resources with us this evening. Thank you also to everyone who's attended. And uh, a copy of tonight's lecture will be shared on the Milton Public Library YouTube site. And uh, we'll also be sharing links uh, in an email that's going out to anyone who has registered for the Laurier, Laurier Milton Lecture Series newsletter. And um, if, please be sure to return on February 9th. We will be um, uh, graced with uh, the presence of Esther Hayford, who will be speaking on African girls and activism in Ontario high schools, an exploratory study. Thank you again, Heidi, much appreciated. And to everyone that attended this evening. Thanks to everyone. Thanks for your questions. It's been a real, it's been really fun. Have a good night. <laughs>